Craig, why don't click on that and we'll pull up uh, Don's slides. Thank you. And you're, you won't need this. Nope, I think I'm oh, good. Oh, but you will need that. Yep. Thank you. Good morning. I want to say thank you to all of you for coming today. And I want to let you know that we're part of the Jeffco Senior Squadron over here at uh, Broomfield Airport. And today we have Donnie Woodyard, who's our Deputy Commander. Our commander is Cheryl Bardell. And Dave Waples is the person who does the uh, teacher and student orientations and flights. So I'm glad they came. I want to do three things today. Um, CAP was stood up in 1941 at a very, very dangerous time. Between January and March of 1942, German U-boats sank 22% of our tanker fleet. We had nothing. And hey, Doc, stand a little bit closer. closer. How about here? You okay? Yeah. And so these were volunteers who stepped up early. And what I'm going to do today is look back at who these people were. We're going to go all the way back to World War I and talk about aviation because this didn't just happen. In, it took 18 months for the Civil Air Patrol to stand up 21 coastal bases to hunt U-boats, do search and rescue, all of that stuff. And it's just amazing what they did. Now, in the Civil Air Patrol, we know this man in the middle, Gil Rob Wilson, who was the giant who founded the Civil Air Patrol. But in actuality, there were many other people who put together the bricks to build that foundation. First of all, that's the Republican mayor uh, Fiorel LaGuardia of New York City. He was appointed by the Democratic president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, in May of 41, before Pearl Harbor, to do the Office of Civil Defense. That's him as a pilot on the Italian front in World War I. He had a very gifted aide. This man is Reed G. Landis, and if you know the name, Ten uh, Kennesaw Mountain Landis was his father. He, his father was a judge who became the baseball commissioner in 1920 with the Black Sox scandal. Reggie Landis shot down eight planes and several balloons. He was an ace. Uh, uh, in the 20s, he became chairman of the American Legion. And also, he became the president of the Association of State Aviation Officials. He, he flew in two groups, a British group, the fourth, uh, squadron, and then that's, he was the 25th Aero Squadron commander. That's Fiorello LaGuardia. And he's flying with an experienced crew. He was doing a lot of public relations. He was a congressman, you know, who had joined up. And I love this statement he made. I can't take the buzzard off and I can't land them, but I can fly the son of a gun. <laughs> so he really wasn't a good pilot, but he was fearless. And for those who would like to know, those are Fiat 200-horse uh, engine. There's a radiator. There's three of them. And the gunner would stand in front of this by the propeller. I mean, it's just amazing what they did. It's a Caproni CA-5. Gil Rob Wilson and his brother, uh, Joseph uh, Volney Wilson, joined up in 1916. They were a part of that group of Americans who went over early. They were ambulance drivers. And because they had worked for the French, they were able to get training with the French. They became bomber pilots. Uh, Joseph Volney Wilson flew every day. He was uh, extremely energetic, and unfortunately, he was killed testing an airplane a month before the war ended. Meanwhile, his brother was told, do not fly this old dilapidated plane. He wanted flight time, and he goes up and tries to do a loop and crashes, breaks himself up so badly he can't fly as a pilot, so he's a gunner. And uh, this is a de Havilland DA5, DH5. And this is the squadron that they ended up with. Now, there are a lot of people that helped build the Civil Air Patrol that are behind the scenes that were exceptionally <coughs> important. So in the 20s, this is a picture of Major Hap Arnold, who became the head of the Air Corps. His aide was uh, Stratemeyer, who taught ground school at Ohio State during the war. And this is Major Carl Spatz, who's in charge of a flying field in France. 
And he, went, he played hooky as a commanding officer and went over to an active squadron and actually went across the German lines and shot down a couple of planes. And these 31st and 13th Aero Squadron badges. Now, the first Yale unit was made up of rich boys at Yale, led by Truby Davison, who put their money together and got Glenn Curtis of the Flying Boats to send an instructor and teach them how to fly flying boats. Then they got trained and they said they started badgering the Navy. You know, hire us, hire us, commission us. And the Navy said, we don't want you rich boys, go away. But finally, they were commissioned and several of them went on. This is Robert Lovett, who we'll see. He eventually became Secretary of Defense. This is Artemis Gates. David Ingalls, both of them were assistant secretaries of the Navy for Air. John Voorhees, he was a uh, representative from Ohio who had a great to deal with the Civil Air Patrol. This uh, Ingalls was the only Navy ace of World War I. He flew with this British Group 213 Squadron. Now, as you know, there was uh, flying the mail was a very dangerous thing. Uh, it was privatized. There were three groups, San Francisco to Cheyenne, that's Rock Springs, that's Rawlins, Council Bluffs in our area. And then there was the Chicago and then the New York routes. They had 70-foot arrows painted. Uh, you can still see some of these if you go on the internet or visit them. Beacons, airmail stamp. And this Maury Graham was one of uh, the distinguished World War I pilots. He had won the Distinguished Flying Cross in the effort to find the lost battalion in World War I. And this is the 50th Aero Squadron that he was in, the little Dutch girl cleanser thing that was going to be uh, clean out Germany. <laughs> this was their thing. He flew for Western Air Express, and in 1930, in a blizzard, he was flying from Las Vegas up by St. George, Utah. His plane went down, and they found him months later. But this is the kind of risks <laughs> people were taking. This is our own El Ray Jeppesen, our airport Jeppesen terminal. And he really was amazing because he kept notes of mountain passes and flight conditions and how to fly into valleys and airports and flying fields. And he put them together. And for those of us who flew in the airlines, they're called JEPs, or they used to be before computers. And he and his wife are buried in Fairlawn Cemetery in East Denver. And that's a Boeing monomail. Now, women were heavily involved with the National Advisory Committee. This is Phoebe only. And she chose five other leading women. And they did the markings across the country. Notice it says north that way. And this is Willington, Connecticut. <clears throat> so you're flying along. Not only do you have the arrows, but you have this. And they were in charge of that. This is Opal Kunz, <clears throat> who was one of the early uh, pioneers, and she taught hundreds of men to fly. Um, Phoebe Omley said, if women can teach men to walk, they can teach them to fly. Now, these were trailblazers. <laughs> I was amazed by this. The civilian pilot training program had over 400,000 graduates. So look at the time, 1938, 1937. 38, Spanish Civil War, Nazi Luftwaffe people are flying, getting experience, ME-109s. We don't have much. But they were training people up. This is Laramie, Wyoming. There was a CPT training operation up there. That's young John Glenn. That's George McGovern. And that's Richard Bong with his Medal of Honor, P-38. This is Dora Doherty, the only woman who was qualified to fly B-29s. This is my favorite slide of the whole show. Do you have any idea what is going on here? Yes. Go ahead, John. Well, uh, we had a, uh, of course, the part of Len Lee's uh, Congress had said uh, we couldn't uh, sell munitions or war equipment to right. the Allies, well, to the bridge, basically. So uh, Roosevelt made a deal. He told uh, Churchill that if he could if he could send horses, wagons, whatever, to tow airplanes across the northern boundary into Canada, that 
he would he would make the airplanes available on the border, which he did, and they pulled them across the border, and they yep. used them in World War II in 39 and 40. And, and that's exactly right. That's a Lockheed Hudson that was flown from Burbank, California, up to Pembina, North Dakota, and there were other places. That's a Canadian farmer who's gone, and I think he was getting $6 an airplane to pull it across. And then he'd pull it across to Canada, and the Royal Canadian Air Force guys would fly it up to Halifax, and these things were used as bombers and reconnaissance. And that's February of 1940. So this is a year and a half before Pearl Harbor. Was, was there an airfield where they... No, it was just flat. And it's winter, so it's hard. And uh, in that day, they didn't need uh, a real airfield. How and many did they pull across? Hundreds. I, I'm, I need to look that up, but I will bet it's thousands because they were, uh, Roosevelt was going underneath, as John said, and this was very, very important. Plus, our people were not supposed to fly for the British or the Canadians, but a lot of people did go up there and they had to raise their hand and say, you know, I'm flying for Canada now. So the first Americans in, into the war, flew for the Canadians and the British. Did they have to renounce their citizenship? There was, there was. They had to stand up, and then they did some kind of a deal where they could sort of say it, but have both. But the idea was, now you're a Brit or a Canadian. And unfortunately, a lot of the ones that went up to fly in Canada had some experience, and so they said, oh, you, you're a flight instructor? You're gonna stay here for the whole war as a flight instructor in Winnipeg. And now this is an unsung hero of the Civil Air Patrol. Nobody knows about him. And I found him, his name is Milton Knight. He was wealthy. He was uh, on the board of directors of Libby Owens Ford, Toledo, Ohio. And in November 38, he came up with the idea of a civilian air reserve for training amateur flyers in any interest in aviation. They set up under the Civil Aeronautics Administration, car units in all those states. And in October 40, he drafted a plan for a national organization. So this was way before the Civil Air Patrol. Gil Rob Wilson, um, he was a giant. Uh, after the war, he was a Presbyterian minister. He eventually became the head of New Jersey's aviation, founder of AOPA, the pilot organization, president of this. And in 41, when Mayor LaGuardia takes over OCD, civilian events, he asked Wilson and these two publishers, Gannett and Beck. And I love these pictures of these guys, you know, smoking. You know, these are the movers and shakers. This is in Washington in the Mayflower Hotel to set up plans. And in the next month, they say, let's do a CADS, Civil Air Defense Services. So you've got two things going on. You've got the CADS and the other one, and eventually Wilson becomes CAP's national director. Now, there's Robert Lovett, who by now is <coughs> Assistant Secretary of War, the Army, for air. There's Hap Arnold. And in August of 41, the Army reviews the car and CAD <coughs> different plans. Hap Arnold has his XO Stratemeyer review them, and basically the CADS ends up being the Civil Air Patrol, and that's December 1st, 41. And if you have any questions or comments, let me know. This is the first commander, John Curry, who's buried at Fort Logan, and the Civil Air Patrol goes down every year to his grave to commemorate that. Notice he was only the commander for two years, or two months. But look at this, he was way ahead. And our, there must be no doubt that our gallant women flyers, they are needed, and in my opinion, indispensable to complete success of Civil Air Patrol. These are Colorado Civil Air Patrol women that were couriers, flying in some very dangerous conditions, delivering stuff. Gil Rob Wilson, in this time, is commanding two regions, all the way from New England, all the way down to Delaware, and then there's a third region that goes down. So this is the very beginning. Two weeks, within two weeks of Pearl Harbor, the Germans sortied five of these U-boats 
to sail to the U.S. And between January and March, they sank 52 tankers, as I said, 22% of our fleet. This is uh, 42 to 45, but all of blue is 1942. They actually, they just devastated us. And the tanker committee of the Petroleum Industry War Council urged the use of cap. However, the Navy was not interested. The Navy was not ready. They had also shrunk between World War I and World War II, but what they were doing, they were trying to piece together a Coast Guard, they call it Coastal Picket Patrol. It was also known as the Hooligan Navy. It was a bunch of people. For example, this was a standard oil uh, executive uh, air, uh, rich guy's yacht. He passed away. His wife gave the Cythera to the Navy in December of 41 war effort. It sunk by a U-boat off North Carolina before 1942 is out. Of the 71, 69 perished. Two were picked up by U-boats. The U-boat picked them up. That was the beginning of the war. This is another civilian yacht paid at Hayes Gray. Look at this, sailing boats. That's a lawyer. He's the vice commodore of the Boston picket patrol. He's up on the top and they are watching. They were trying to build 60 vessels in 60 days. We're hopelessly behind. So by fall of 42, they had 480 boats. So the Navy's doing their own thing. Now, this is the laydown of the command structure. We've talked about Arnold and Stratemeyer. Spatz is in there. Hugh Drum, as in Fort Drum, New York. Uh, Robert Lovett, Assistant Secretary for Air. And in the Navy, both Ingalls and Gates held the job eventually of Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Air. This guy hated the uh, concept of uh, Civil Air Patrol but the army helped. Now, if you look, this is a, another giant in the Civil Air Patrol. This is Gil Rob Wilson, and this big man, Earl Johnson, played football for Ohio State's 1916 championship team. He also happened to be David Ingalls' neighbor. And together, Johnson and Ingalls were both uh, representatives in the Ohio legislature, and they were buddies he becomes head of the Bureau of Aeronautics in Ohio. And you're going to see Ohio, Ohio, Ohio throughout this presentation. Ohio was a big part of the beginning of Civil Air Patrol. And Donnie Woodyard came from the Ohio Civil Air Patrol. They, here it is, Earl Johnson established in 41 the Ohio CADS program, which was Gil Rob Wilson's idea. And Representative Voris uh, mentioned that this guy had so much energy. Now, the Army sort of tiptoed into letting the Civil Air Patrol do a 90-day trial. Let's see how it goes. The Navy doesn't want Civil Air Patrol. And they started doing convoy, escort, and anti-submarine patrols. So a lot of the effort in World War II was searching an area, search and rescue, picking up survivors, looking for submarines. You know, at that time there were no snorkels, so submarines had to rise and charge batteries every night. The first task force, which became Coastal Base One, Atlantic City. Second task force, Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. Anybody want to take a guess why those were the first two bases? Delaware River goes up to all the oil refineries. So at that time, Philadelphia was the center of oil refining, and from there, the oil would go over to Britain. So this was exceptionally important. 75 horsepower Stinson and a Sikorsky, some rich guy's uh, flying boat, 300 horse. That's the Blue Hens. It says, quick uh, dive. Here comes der Blue Hen and the Blue Hens of uh, Delaware. Now, down in Florida, this guy was a giant, Mike, uh, his, Major Ike Vermilia. He was the guy that owned Palm Beach Aero. It was a fixed base operator. And they put together 
a Florida Air Defense Unit. This is before Civil Air Patrol, and they all got together. And so when the Civil Air Patrol actually happened, he threw together this in a matter of weeks. And they were doing patrols off the eastern part of Florida, which was extremely important. This is their uh, insignia. And you can see this struggling uh, Piper Cub trying to carry a 100-pound bomb by Zach Mosley. And this was the third task force, Lantana, Florida, near Palm Beach. This is Ike Vermilia. And it says... This is a third interceptor command of the Army Air Force. Really liked what they were doing. The exercise enabled us to test the training of observation post filter and information center personnel and communication details. So they were doing what the current Civil Air Patrol does as an auxiliary to the Air Force. Now, sometimes our planes go out and act as targets or relays and things like this. And so these guys immediately stood up in the first months. And here are some people from Florida. And I just want to point out, this is a patch. That's a U-boat conning tower. That's a bomb coming down. And that's what he has on his. So he apparently looks to me like he's had th three successful sightings. Now, there's a whole lore that the Civil Air Patrol sank two submarines. But I had that in my thing when I gave the national talk. And I said, don't mention that. Don't mention that. That <laughs> probably didn't happen. And it didn't. But they found a lot. Now, this is what was going on. That's a burning ship off of eastern Florida. So these are Civil Air Patrol. That's Civil Air Patrol insignia. These are active duty Army Air, Force, Air Corps. And that guy looks like he's got Royal Air Force wings. Yep. He could be Royal Air Force. I don't know. This man... Uh, Harry Blee, who looks like he's all business down at Albany Municipal Airport with the Georgia Civil <coughs> Air Patrol, he was retired and he was the CAP operations officer. This is April 15th. This is four months after Pearl Harbor. Here's a page. It's secret. Here's how to hunt German U-boats. Here's what they do. Here's how they surface. And CAP was getting about 850 volunteers per month. You would get seven to eight dollars a day for air crew and five dollars for ground crew. So in the Gil Rob Wilson, Earl Johnson, and Harry Blee are the ones that created these patrol bases between March of 42, go around another year until the uh, Navy took over uh, its own operations, August 31st, 1943. And we're going to talk about where these bases were put. So first, we're up here, one and two, and then Lantana, Florida. As you can see, they built out through Flagler Beach. Then number six is St. Simons Island, Georgia. And seven, Miami, Florida, eight, Charleston, nine, Grand Isle, Louisiana. They've got to protect the Gulf Coast and the Houston shipping channels, the Beaumont, Pascagoula, Brownsville, all the way, Corpus Christi, where I was based, all the way to Brownsville, Texas. Then they go back and finish up Mantillo, North Carolina. You know, with the Outer Banks, there was a lot of submarine activity. And then they do Riverhead on Long Island, all the way up through Bar Harbor, Maine, and they put in Beaufort, North Carolina, two wings under the Army Air Force Anti-Submarine Command. Smoke them if you got them. You know, we used to say no smoking within 50 feet of the airplane. <laughs> Heck, go for it. I love these pictures. Look at the difference in horsepower. So there's a Piper J3 Cub, 65 horsepower. They're going to hang a 100-pound bomb on that. <laughs> What were they thinking? But they were, they were motivated. This is a Waco with 225 horse, which was a, a good airplane at the time. So in October 42, they're under these Army Air Force anti-submarine commands. Remember, a year later, the Navy's going to take over everything and say, Army, you go back to bombing. 
no more playing around in the ocean. <coughs> this is a typical person. Um, Henry Phipps, he just learns to fly in 1939. He's the personnel officer. But then they let him start flying. By 42, he has 500 hours over water alone. He's also ditched. And then he becomes a procurement inspector. So who were these guys? A lot of them were older. They couldn't get in the Army Air Corps. Army Air Corps was washing out 40% of the people. So th these were volunteers. Some of them brought their own airplanes. So here is Henry Phipps again. Now he's got better equipment. At the beginning, they couldn't even get May Wests. They had no flotation devices. But now he's got a poopy suit, which is hot and heavy to wear. There's his charting uh, pad. And you can see him. And he ditched. And you, if you ditched, you got this duck pen. You can get him, see him on eBay or whatever. 15, so I'm weird. I want to know where were these ducks? Well, most of them were in Miami and St. Simons, Georgia, and Atlantic City, and then Rehoboth and Long Island. So that shows the amount of flying that was going on. This is the observer wing from World War I or World War II. And in 42, seven months after CAP is formed, the first death. A man from uh, Columbus, Ohio, was an observer. He died on a Coastal Base 2 mission out of Rehoboth. We're now in the spring of 1942. This is Gulf America. 19 were killed. This is right off Jacksonville, Florida, where I was stationed in the Navy. In May, 46 ships are sunk off Louisiana alone. By August, U-boats across the Atlantic had sh sunk 400 ships and 5,000 were killed. The Germans called this the happy time because the U-boats were able to dominate. This is a memorial uh, in a park in Jacksonville, Florida. First to go, last to return. This is a symbol of the Merchant Marine. 760 merchant ships sunk in World War II. One of every 26 seamen was killed the highest casualty rate of any service. So the Navy, because all these ships are getting knocked off of Louisiana, starts putting in around the Gulf Coast. So there's CB-15, Corpus Christi, Grand Isle with their Pelican, the B, Pascagoula, and then this is um, Panama City, Miami, and these are the scouting areas, you can see their area of patrol, usually went out 60 miles, 60 miles in a J3 Cub, two guys, it's hot, and in many cases they're carrying a bomb. It's crazy. And this shows, here's a mover and a shaker, Representative John Voorhees requested that CAP activate a coastal base in Panama City, Florida. Ohio's up here, but straight down in the panhandle, they go down there and there's this old army, uh, there was nothing there. It was a concrete pad and they suddenly in several weeks put it together. And Major Dodge and the coastal patrol unit from Ohio set it up. And this is Donald Duck with roller skates on a bomb. I mean, <laughs> every, and they were willing to accept necessary risk required to successfully complete the mission. We have operational risk management, Civil Air Patrol. They also developed procedures and training to reduce risks. And there were a lot of risks. This man, Robert Arne, is an absolute hero. So he went through pilot training, that CPT training. And then he got secondary training at Ohio State. And then in February 42, pilots were desperately manned to fly, and he took his neck brace off because he'd been in an accident and broken his neck, and went downtown with his paperwork from CPT and was selected with 12 people. In 10 months, six of the original 12 pilots were dead. They were flying out over the Gulf of Mexico. He himself flew 179 missions, 557 hours, so that's 
over three hours each. And then he went on to fly all sorts of transport in the Army Air Corps. Now this is a picture of Earl Johnson congratulating Colonel George Stone, uh, who was commander of the Air Wing, uh, the Ohio Wing, 42 to 47, and was also, after the war, the Civil Air Patrol Board uh, Chair. Um, he tragically died in 48 on a flight from Washington, Ohio, and Earl Johnson died tragically piloting a plane from Ohio to Washington. So they were both dead in a couple years. In the middle of all this, they put together a cadet training program, October of 42. You had to be 15 to 18, and here's a get together in Michigan. You can see it's every airplane in the area. And I should say, at the beginning of World War II, the federal government in Washington wanted to ground every private plane because they, A, didn't want a plane being used to bomb anything. We were petrified that German agents or something. And secondly, didn't want to use the gas. But thankfully, uh, CAP and uh, the government embraced it. This is an interesting picture. EA-6B flight computer. He's got one under his hand. Notice he's got the submarine hunting patch. This is off the coast of North Carolina, and it's showing the different radials they'll be flying out on. And these guys have got their clipboard, plotting board. He's got his rescue signals here. Older man, younger man, everybody stood up. <coughs> this is my really good picture. That is a really good airplane. It's a Fairchild 24. I think it had 225 horse. This would have been owned by a rich guy who donated it. Maybe that's the rich guy, one of these older guys. Maybe it's the Jeffco Senior Squadron. I don't know. <laughs> this, but they got a young guy with them who's probably the pilot. And look, he's wearing a poopy suit. And for anybody who's worn one of these things, I had to put one on once, for real. And it's not fun to fly in. It's hot. But they do have Mae West. They got their 100-pound bomb. They've got their survival gear. Think of the weight. Plotting charts. Plotting charts, you know, and they're going to go out of Riverhead, New York, on the tip of Long Island. And again, our ORM principle number one, accept no unnecessary risk. It's the war's on. We're going to go out there. We are, you know, going to uh, risk our lives. This is a picture of that base, which did have a Sikorsky flying boat and a couple other things. But notice most are single engine small planes. CB-17. Question? Yeah. Uh, when, you were, when they were flying a 87, 85 horsepower, yeah. with a 100 pound bomb. bomb underneath, Yep. they were out on the mission for two or three hours. If they didn't drop the bomb, could they brought it back. With it? Brought it back. They brought it back. Yeah. It's nuts. It, you're right. That's a really good point. And I'm going to show you the weight and balance on this. This is St. Simon's Island, their patch. You know, again, Donald Duck with his magnifying glass. This is a radio operator patch. So everybody talks about pilots and observers, but to keep all this infrastructure going, you needed skilled people. And this is what they said, 6,000 hours over water with single motored airplanes and a perfect record. Thanks, engineering. You've done a swell job. If you hadn't, we would be here. I guess that's my favorite patch, the flying washing machine, because you're in a J3 Cub. And, uh, this is Flagler Beach, Florida, another one that was stood up quickly. So here it is, the J3 Cub with 65 horsepower and density altitude is it's a problem because if you have high humidity altitude, they're low altitude, but they have high temperature, they're just dragging around. Always overloaded. And can we talk about stress? I was a maintenance department head. These wings are being stressed and it could crumple, anything could happen. And these weren't exactly the newest planes that they had. So they even had, uh, I found they had 325 pound Navy depth bombs on some of the flying boats. 
And then this is Manteo, North Carolina. There, again, Donald Duck with an ax. And these guys are, you know, just showing off with a bomb. Except no unnecessary risk. Well, they shouldn't be walking around with a bomb. <laughs> this is a plane that has had 11 anti-submarine patrols. This is the stuff they're carrying, survival gear. These are small, either um, like grenades to drop or smoke bombs, because a lot of it was to mark where the submarine was so that the Navy could send in their few anti-submarine uh, boats. And Frank Blazik was the Civil Air Patrol historian, and he wrote this book. He's done the most work if you look on the internet. So this is what happens when you're retired and you, um, it's COVID time. So you do weight and balance on a J3 Cub and you find out with the 100 pound bomb, you've got 280 pounds left for pilot and observer survival gear, always overloaded. Now, a Fairchild and a Waco, you were in better position, but you can see that this was the predominant airplane and they were really, really taking risk. This is from Virginia. It's one year into it, December of 42. This is a restricted mimeographed newspaper. And it says, we the undersigned of CB4, whose duty is to guard the shores and protect it from enemies who are bent upon death and destruction. On Christmas Eve 42, solemnly swear we're fighting the best of our abilities and will fight even to death those who, so that those who live in this country may be equal. That's very interesting. Here's some pictures. This guy's from Oakland, California. This guy was at St. Simons, Georgia. Women, Colonel Arne. And this is Hap Arnold in 44, thinking back. It was set up and went into operation almost overnight. It patrolled our shores at a time of almost desperate national crisis. Uh, danger, bombs loaded. That guy's got his revolver and looks like about 12 extra shells. He looks like he's ready to go after that U-boat. And this is what we say in cap now before you fly, I am safe, you know, are you? And these guys were flying in all sorts of conditions, fatigue, etc. In April of 43, cap was transferred from uh, the Office of Civil Defense to the War Department to the Army Air Forces. And at the end of August, the Navy finally took over anti-submarine patrols. They didn't want CAP. So CAP went with the Army Air Force as the first bomber command. And not my favorite guy. He was a mean guy, Admiral King. But uh, he said the service... And the Army and uh, him agreed they would, uh, the Navy was in a position to assume the duties. He ordered the activation of Coastal Patrol, sundown August 31st, and the Eastern Defense Command, Army Air Forces, 1st Bomber Command, and disbanded the ASW wings. So now they're out of the ASW business, anti-submarine. But he gave them a BZ, a well done for doing this. And this is, I found this on the internet. Look at that guy. He's got his tie perfectly. He's got that cocked hat, first lieutenant, proud Civil Air Patrol guy. So what did they do? They did target sleeve towing, which is dangerous. <laughs> With these crazy new army pilots, they did forest patrol because of like in the Pacific Northwest, the Japanese were sending over balloons with flares, trying to burn it. And they did... This was the land patrol lower, and there two died and 13 were lost. They did search and rescue, six died. This guy had no legs and he flew over a thousand hours of patrol on this border patrol. So that's, yes ma'am. You're talking about the Atlantic coast. I'm from San Francisco. After uh, uh, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, did the Japanese have a submarine force 
And did we set up cap on the um, they, Pacific Coast? They didn't set up cap on the Pacific Coast. The Japanese did send long-range submarines off of Oregon, Washington, and they put up these balloons, paper balloons that would float with the wind, and they were trying to burn down our forests. So these guys in the West, in California, Oregon, did patrol for the forest itself, for forest fires, from what I can tell. But that's a good question. The coastal patrol was the U-boat threat, the Germans on the East Coast. And our own uh, First Lieutenant Ben Berger volunteered, and he died flying a courier patrol out of Coastal Base 1 in Atlantic City. Um, this is Coastal Base 1. And he died on takeoff. And, you know, you're full of gas, you're full of stuff, you're flying in all sorts of weather. 20% of CAP were women. And then the women uh, Army service pilots, 50% of them came from CAP. This is a, again, smoke them if you got them, Chesterfield ad. And this woman's the head of operations, and she's having a cigarette to make sure things are going right. It's great. This is... Uh, propping a plane by a Civil Air Patrol woman. This is a Norg appliance ad, and it shows a woman flying a night patrol. You know, this is all Hollywood stuff. Um, this is our courier people flying uh, across the country. And also in Colorado, I found out they did mapping, especially the mountain area, to better the safe flying routes. And this woman was a trailblazer, Louisa Spruance Morse. She became the Delaware Wing Commander after World War II. So she was the first woman wing or state commander. Thousand in the women's Air Force service pilots. No veteran benefits until 77. 850 wasps left. And they flew everything, uh, bombers, fighters from factories. They didn't get paid, did they? Uh, they did get paid. Oh, they, did? they did. They were an auxiliary of the Army Air Force or Army Air Corps. Yeah. They went through, if you look them up, they all went through this very tough base in, I think, North Texas or out in the middle. And um, a lot of them had flight time before, but they had to go through Army training. And of course, I'm sure they could tell some stories. I put this in to talk about the Army Air Corps and the Navy. Look at, we talked about the civilian pilot training. Air Corps trained 192,000. The washout rate was 40%. 15,000 died before they went overseas. 40,000 in action. The Navy, look at that, from 4,000 to 60,000. High washout rate, same. Just in 1945, 3,000 dead. Three th and because of the war, they were willing to accept this. Some guy with 200 hours, 250 hours out on a boat. Hey, John, when you went to the, when you were, got your wings, uh, how many hours did you have in total? Yeah, I got my wings? Yeah, because he was a carrier. 250. 250, but very highly trained and, uh, you know, very rigorous. And uh, these guys are being pushed through. But those were non-combat fatalities? Then? Yes. It's a, a dangerous time to be in the air. What happened to this plane? It was strafing in North Italy near Grosseto, and a guy got a little too low. <laughs> and P-47, he flew it back. It was a rough runner, as we say. <laughs> there, was, there was a P-3 that, that did that. Still flew. That's true. That? Yes, I do. <laughs> that, I do. I was not, yes. So again, lessons learned by the military and CAP. Now, uh, the procedures. 
And this is the overview. CAP reported 57 subs. Now, some of that was we saw a wake and it looked like a sub. They, but this is big. They rescued 363 people at sea, flew 24 million miles in 18 months of coastal patrol. 90 planes lost at sea, 114 ditched, 26 died. Now, that's through 43. That's just in 18 months. Then the total 200,000 served in some sort of capacity in CAP. 68 died, 150 airplanes lost, and Roosevelt awarded 824 air medals to CAP. And there's the third Task Force Lantana. And here's Earl Johnson beaming because President Truman in 40, uh, signed uh, public law 79476, an act to incorporate the Civil Air Patrol as a permanent thing in 1946. He died, and after that in 48, a new law designating CAP as Air Force Civilian Auxiliary, which we still are today. Next. This is something I found on the internet uh, from Embry-Riddle, they have a photo section, and this is in Florida, New Smyrna Beach. And over the top of this dilapidated Civil Air Patrol hut that's in disrepair, it says, those things we do that others may live, which encapsulates, you know, all these people that stood up and uh, in many cases gave their lives uh, during World War II. So that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. When um, the caption was um, that, uh, that we all may be equal, yeah. was, they were referring to being equal before the law and opportunity. Yeah, right? I think so. And that really struck me because that was in Virginia. Out in the, I lived in Virginia for quite a long time, and where they were was pretty segregated. And whoever wrote that up was maybe from the north or whatever. Yeah. Yep. John. I can't remember what uh, year, when did the Air Force take over uh, administration of the Civil I, The Air Force was created in 1947 as a separate service. And then in 48, they created the Civil Air Patrol and that public law as an auxiliary. So it seems to me that that was the defining moment around 48 when they made an auxiliary. But I, yes, sir. Uh, why was Ohio such an important focus? Because the Wright brothers and Wright Patterson Air Force Base and those things, I'm from Dayton. Yeah, so you're, <laughs> I think you're exactly right. I think it was because uh, all that, the Air Force research and development test, right. and also because Ohio was a very big state in comparison to the other states at the time, and the politicians had a lot of sway. And Donnie, you were there. What's your view on why Ohio? I, I think you just hit it. You know, you have that aviation background there. You had the influence of Wright, Wright Pat and all that coming together. And it was just uh, real forward leaning in aviation. Um, that'd be my. Wright Patterson was created because it was at the Huffman Prairie oh. where the Wright brothers brought their second plane. Really? And that's where, yeah. that's why Wright really? Patterson is there. Patterson was an inventor and, you know. Really? NCR and, and, yep. and those things. But uh, uh, that's, where, that's why it's there. And it's still there, the flying field that they were at. There's reproductions <coughs> of the little shed and whatever. Uh, and above that, looking over the Wright-Patterson area is Wright State, which is a university. Right. And yeah. that's the depository outside of Washington, D.C. in the the uh, National Archives for the Wright Brothers wow. Memorial and, and um, Memorabilia. And I think you hit it on the head. And also there's a parallel here in Colorado. We have the Air Force Academy. We have Colorado Springs. Our wing commander, Colonel John Rhodes, 
is in Colorado Springs. The bulk of the Civil Air Patrol in Colorado is centered around all those retired people. So I think you, you hit on something. Thank you. John. Well, I, I just grew up in Columbus. Ohio, okay. And that was a big aviation there. I wanted to fly ever since I was a kid. Out of right. Columbus, but uh, they produced airplanes uh, during World War II uh, yeah. Columbus, at the uh, Columbus, Port Columbus uh, Airport. Uh, and uh, so there were a lot of av a lot of pilot training right. going on, I think, all during that time. So there were a lot of aviators, a lot of pilots. Yep. Uh, that was, uh, yes, Lou. The training base was a sort of field, Sweetwater Yeah. Okay. Avenger Field, Sweetwater, Texas for the wasps. Thank you. And that was out there, right, Lou? Yeah. <laughs> Even by Air Force standards, it's out there. Yeah. And, by the way, uh, talking about the wasps, we have a, an excellent uh, display it's in our World War II women's room. Yes. Of stories of women wasps from Colorado wow. and what they did. So wow, that's wonderful. That. Yes, sir. Well, we had a woman wasp about four or five years ago. I don't know if she's passed or not. A local really? woman. Yes. yes. She used to visit out the Jeff Coast Fly. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you. That's great. And their stories and can you imagine what they went through to go down to Avenger Field, get through the training, and then go out to some factory and be stationed and, you know, yeah. who knows what was going well, on. Well, they didn't get, uh, after the war, you know, they were disbanded. They, were, they had to pay their way home. Yeah. Wow. Uh, they, were, they were paid. Yeah. Uh, they did not have that many benefits. Yep. And if they, even if they died, the military wouldn't pay to ship their, well. Right. I think they had to chip in for funerals. One of the things about their, when they were flying, a lot of times when they went to the factories, at the factories, uh, because test flying these brand new airplanes took pilots' time and stuff, they simply would write it off. So these gals were getting into airplanes that they'd never taken off. That's right. Right. Oh my goodness. Just because it's a war effort, just get that plane to that base. Yeah. And so they were taking huge risk. And I don't think they had any quality control for anything at that right. time. Right. <laughs> and those... I had, I had an uncle who worked at factories. And yeah. He said there was no quality control. Nah. The airplane was full offline and they flew. Yep. You know, whether it was completely assembled or not. Yep. And that's why they had so many fatalities uh, with, uh, air, with aircraft at that time because most of the people working in assembly plants did not have a fifth grade education. That's so, yeah, true. Most of them could not, most of them, I mean greater than 60 percent, yeah. could not read and write. That's amazing. And also a lot of the people that were skilled had been drafted or had gone into the military, so you had a lot of new people doing new jobs. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I suppose there are several books that cover a lot of the information you've given. Right. Yeah, uh, the best one is if you look up Frank Blazik, B-L-A-Z-I-C-H, and he has written this several things because he was the historian. That's probably the best. But I uh, cruised around the Internet, and it was amazing what you can find out. And if you go to Ohio Civil Air Patrol, Blazik wrote their extensive history, and it's just amazing what they did. And these people, those when people say, well, Gil Rob Wilson started on December 1st, there were all these people kind of spun up already that surged to the front. And Gil Rob Wilson had to corral them and, you know, start creating these bases. But these people flew on their own nickel with their own airplanes to these bases they didn't know. Our guy from Denver who died, he went all the way from Denver to Atlantic City flying in, you know, bad weather and everything else. They were amazing. And single-engine airplanes, underpowered. Um, any, uh, yes, Dave? Do you know what the reasons were for the aircraft losses? Um, from what I can tell, reading, you know, the, the accident reports, a lot of them were bad weather. A lot of these people didn't have a lot of instrument time. Like, they rolled in. Um, a lot of them, one of the problems they initially had was they were flying by themselves. So if you went in the water, 
nobody was there to call it in. So then they started flying in twos in a pair. And then the other problem was, so you're in the water and it's the winter because we have to fly all year round. How long can you last until that guy, maybe with a radio, maybe not, get somebody to come out and rescue you and you're dead from exposure. So I think a lot of it was weather, icing up. Um, there were out of that uh, one in Panama City of the six people that died, two of them came together. In other words, they had a midair. And they, you know, these are guys with two or 300 hours maybe flying and doing these really tough jobs. So, I so have a yes. Is there anything left of these coastal patrol bases? N not really, because there are signs, and <laughs> if you look on the internet, you might be able to find out where they were, but in many cases, like the Lantana field was taken over by something bigger and they might have a sign up. But these, this was also a flash in time. It was 18 months. Right. And in Civil Air Patrol, we think, oh yeah, they did this for a long time. It was 18 months from the time they stood it up to the time the Navy said, okay, we got it now and you guys go back to the Army and, and do that. Yeah, you might talk about the regions. The yeah. Nowadays, you know, we're the mountain region. Yeah, we're the mountain region with Colorado, Utah, Wyoming. Yeah, New Mexico. And so the regions are set up with a regional commander, and then they have the state commanders who are wing commanders. And then each of us in the squadrons. We're a senior squadron, but there's also squadrons that concentrate on cadets, like down around here, uh, Colorado Springs a lot. And there's three main missions, emergency service or search and rescue, which Donnie is heavily involved in. Um, I am a right seat guy uh, in that. And then there's aerospace education, which is this outreach. And then there's the cadet program. So. It's interesting, I thought search and rescue was a really big deal because that's what I came from. I was in P3, long range patrol stuff. It turns out that in the Civil Air Patrol now, with all the satellites and with all the GPS and everything else, the, there's, there's more of an emphasis, I think, on cadets in aerospace. It, there's a trend going, is that, Dave, do you feel that too? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. 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 I mean, the, the number of, uh, planes that crash and search and rescue, those numbers are just reducing, which is good. Um, and then technology, uh, Civil Air Patrol has a cell phone forensic team um, that does national forensics. So if you have a lost hiker, instead of going up and flying around, they use cell phone forensics and they're like, this is where they're at. So the mission is changing. And we have some interesting people because Donnie happens to be the head of emergency services for the state of Colorado and CDPHE department. And he came from Ohio, right? Yes, so he's got a lifetime of experience in this and now he's our deputy commander. And uh, yes, sir. Well, years ago, before we received uh, cell phones, we were flying full of bore most of the time. Right. And uh, come weekends, uh, the guys who had work jobs, they mm -hmm. was they would swap out the old timers. Mm. And yep. uh, I have been on missions where we had three missions in one day and back home at five mm. o'clock. Right. I think Bob and I was off on one of those. Wow. Uh, before we got cell phones, yeah. it was an everyday almost uh, thing. Mm. And uh, uh, we, we saved quite a few people lives. But That's today, everybody have a radio, a yep. cell phone of some sort. And that is the biggest aid that hikers, hunters, and that's so right. forth uh, take all of that away from it. So we have to. However, that's a good thing. Right. You don't have to go out there and find people. Right. Because the last mission I was on, the, the couple <coughs> left on a Saturday. We didn't find them until Thursday morning. 
Wow. And they didn't, no one called, it, called in right. until Wednesday night. Wow. Wow. So it's, it's a long time to lay out there on the ground. That is. And, and, uh, and, and if any of you think about it, just go in your house one, one day, go out in the backyard, turn off all the lights, and sit there <laughs> <laughs> and get a feel for what it's like out there. And, and there are animals all around looking at you, and you look yeah. at them. It's not a, it's not a pretty sight. And, so? and, and, in, and in school, they taught us that I don't care how experienced you are, once you get lost, you will never exceed a five-mile circle. And I have known for people to, to get lost seven, eight, nine day, out, uh, days and don't leave it in no more than five miles from where they started. Yep. And it reminds me of what you said. So much of the search and rescue is involving coordination of ground teams, uh, a command post, and air search, and that whole ability to do it. And when I first got here, I came from uh, Virginia, which is pretty warm, and they're saying, bring a heavy coat with you in the summer, because if you're up there overnight, or on the side of a mountain or something, so one of our problems is weight and balance, we have to be honest about our weight, because your weight, plus 10 pounds of clothes and gear or 20. And now you're, sometimes we fly out of here at high density altitude, you know, high altitude in the summer, tight, yep. Well, uh, Forrest Cabdo, I don't recall us ever losing an airplane unless one have, we've lost one in the last three years. Is that right? Uh, I have known one engine seize on yeah. takeoff. Yeah, I think you're right. We've, they've been very fortunate so far. The last 25 years. Yep. Uh, somebody, John. Well, the, you mentioned communications yeah. in, your, you know, in the yeah. World War II with the Civil Air Patrol, and uh, I found that interesting because, of course, training now in the Civil Air Patrol, I was in the Civil Air Patrol for several years, uh, the training emergency services uh, and the training that goes on with the cadets and the senior group in communications and the HF radio for, uh, yeah. units that we have there at Jeffco. I don't know a lot of people realize that the Air Force did away with their HF communications uh, years ago. I think they've reinstated it. They, they, yeah. They, they, they did they, away with it. And the only, <coughs> the, the only organization that had HF uh, communication available was the Civil Air Patrol. Yeah, yeah, right. Yep. And, uh, if ever anything went down, we know that things can go down. Yeah. Computers, um, they referenced Southwest Airlines and uh, yeah. FAA yeah. recently. Yeah. Uh, all of a sudden, you have to have a backup, and yeah. that was the only backup, and it was it was maintained by the Civil yeah. Air Patrol. And it's still maintained. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Yep. What is AJ? Or what does that mean? So it's like shortwave radios that could go a long way. They bounce off the clouds and the earth from World War II, old-fashioned radios. And nowadays, everybody's got a little digital this and that, you know. And but you need satellites. You do. Transmitter towers and all that. Yes. If they're down, you're out. Yep. Yeah. And that's... Well, we were here in this state. I have had a break from Civil Air Patrol three or four years, I guess. Uh, we had 22 repeaters throughout the whole state of Colorado. Yep. Because the state of Colorado maintains Civil Air Patrol repeater sites. And, uh, and as I remember, uh, we could select certain portions of the state wherever there is an act, uh, re a referral act where, where there's like, activity is going on. Right. And, you know, bypass the other states and keep them out of the traffic of the needed states. Right. So uh, we, as I recall, we had the best communication in the United States here in Colorado. And it's an important place to be because it's in the middle with the mountains. And by the way, I want to just segue during COVID, people like Donnie and others flew PPE when there wasn't any PPE to small places, Indian right. tribes, places around the state. So Civil Air Patrol was used in uh, making PPE and uh, flying it. 
I was with uh, environmental health, and we also actually this is sort of a private and uh, sort of a confidential that would <coughs> as several air patrol maintain uh, our security in case there's a national event that happens here in Colorado right because of we are number seven on the most on the possible uh, hit list and uh, of course we have uh, water supplies here in this state right that, that are su supplies like 17 or 19 states of water yep that's and right that's very important that is very important and of course we got buckley out here also we got buckley and we got cheyenne mountain right. and all of thank you that's a great any other yes ma'am there are so few of you really Civil Air Patrol people that, you know, what, did you notice uh, some kind of um, pattern as to why you guys got into Civil Air Patrol as opposed to the other services? Um, well, they were in the other services. They, yeah, so, I'm a Navy guy, so I'm a lieutenant colonel in the uh, Civil Air Patrol, and I that still makes me feel funny because I'm a Navy commander, <laughs> <in the old laughs> okay. and so is John. <laughs> Okay, but you decided to go into it, not just stay with the Navy, because the Civil Air Patrol represents something to you. I will so I tell you, there's a lady named Dr. Barb Adams, who is our head of aerospace education. She and I taught courses for DU OLLI on aviation, and she joined the Civil Air Patrol, and I went, well, I guess I'll join the Civil Air Patrol. So she, I help her, but she's the the key person in our squadron in and all and she's a PhD person so there's a lot of un, people from different walks of life there's an astronaut down in Chicago uh, Colorado Springs there's people who come out to do this volunteer work Donna you want to say anything or Dave why did you get in Civil Air Patrol David uh, well I've always been involved in aviation and uh, my education and everything else and uh, I was looking for something to do in retirement and so I started more, a little more than two years before I retired um, so, so that's how I got involved. so well, there's so retired yep yeah so retired Navy retired Air right Air. so so like what you see you're retired so to answer your question I, I've been in the CEP since 77 yeah so I started out as a cadet, cadet. so you have yeah, people like me that started out as a cadet and like it just got my blood and there's you know mm -hmm. I'm gonna die you know bleeding blue but then you've also got parents of cadets that join the program, right? And they help out, and those are usually the people. Those that's probably the bulk of people that are between, say, thirty-five and retirement age. But then you've got the aviation guys who are, you know, they're private pilots or maybe even commercial pilots or whatever. But they, their civilian job doesn't allow them to fly. But then the Civil Air Patrol allows them to fly and actually get real training and contribute. And I maybe put words in your mouth, but it's kind of a rewarding way to fly and not have to spend a lot of money out of your pocket. Yep. So those are kind of the three main groups. Right. Go ahead. So why I joined the Civil Air Patrol, my son came home one night and he wanted to pick one of the check to join the Civil Air Patrol and because he wanted to go to the Air Force Academy. Well. However, he went into the Naval Academy. Good for him. So that is why I was a Ma'am, the reason why we joined is because I'm ex-Army. And so I have right. many years of uh, two tours in Korea. But anyway, that is one of the reasons why. So my son, in turn, in